So Reed, let me know when we're ready. We're good? All right, hey, welcome to those of you who are watching online, catching this video later. Great to be with you all. Thank you for being here in person. Uh, tonight, this is a follow-up. This is part two. It goes with the study that we did last week on Oprah Winfrey, and tonight it's on Aaron Rodgers, why Aaron Rodgers is not Christian. And as I mentioned last week, Oprah is not Christian in her teaching and her commitments, but she does refer to herself as being a Christian. So it's a little bit confusing, but then she um, rejects most traditional biblical Christian teaching and very decisively left her Baptist uh, faith background in her 20s when she rejected the idea of God's jealousy and, and then started having some other problems and, and followed after a number of new age spiritual gurus and believes that all of truth needs to come together. You know, you got Jesus' truth and other gurus' truth, and we all are seeking out our own uh, divinity within ourselves. So that message, of course, is not biblical Christianity. But in the case of Aaron Rodgers, Aaron very specifically, decidedly has rejected uh, Christian faith and his Christian upbringing. And in fact, as it turns out and has become apparent in the last decade, um, has a very seemingly fractured relationship with his parents and his family uh, in which he grew up, uh, most of whom are still, at one level or another, pretty committed Christians and involved in the church. And uh, this seems to be uh, something that is, has a personal dimension to it as well. Uh, we're going to go ahead and show, since I have Reed available, we'll go ahead and show a video of, as you may know, Aaron Rodgers, who is now looking to go into a new NFL team, has dated and moved through a number of relationships in his 20s and 30s with various uh, women, some of whom, you know, very beautiful women, very uh, celebrity uh, women in some case. One of his uh, girlfriends uh, several years ago was Danica Patrick, the former uh, race car driver. You may remember Danica Patrick, you know, she's still a celebrity now, and she has a podcast and video, and this is from an interview that I believe he was maybe still dating her, uh, or, or maybe she was the recent ex-girlfriend, but in any event, Dan, Danica is interviewing Aaron Rodgers, you'll see they're sitting down talking, and he discusses, this is in 2020, that he decisively now has left any commitment to Christian faith, and he talks about how religion can be helpful for some people, and if, that, if it works for you, that's okay, but that religion often is a crutch and a, a, an excuse for people to go into us versus them type of psychology, and he really doesn't like it, and he doesn't like the, uh, the binariness of um, biblical or Christian faith. So I'll come back to that. We'll talk about that. Let's go ahead and show the video, and if you're watching online, you can go ahead and see the video. This will then lead into some of our other discussion tonight. There's not really a young life for college. It's, it gets into more organized, you know, athletes in action or whatever it might be, campus organizations. And I just didn't find any connection points with, with those things and started questioning things and had friends who had other beliefs and uh, enjoyed learning. That's kind of a part of my life. I had some good friendships along the way that uh, helped me, you know, to figure out what exactly I wanted to believe in. And ultimately it was that uh, rules and regulations and binary systems um, don't really resonate with me. You know, enjoyed learning about other religions and meeting the Dalai Lama. And, you know, it's been a, a fun path to to a different type of spirituality, which uh, which to me is more. It's been more meaningful. Would you just? All right, so as you can see, um, Aaron um, just doesn't like the binary, the rules and the regulations that are reflected in a biblical understanding of God or lifestyle or faith. 
Uh, he thinks that's, he finds that very restrictive, uh, regimented, and rejects the concept of the binary. Um, now, what's of note, and I thought this worked pretty well, we could talk about Oprah, who's extremely influential throughout the 21st century, late 20th century, throughout the 21st century, still very current, very influential, right into this present year. We're in 2023 recording this. Aaron Rodgers is very much a celebrity, a sports star who emerged, really became a, a huge star at the very end of the first decade of the 21st century and has continued through now into the third decade of the 21st century. But neither one of them says they reject Christian faith because of um, Christian strictures on abortion or sexuality and gender issues. Uh, now, I'm sure if we poked at those issues, both persons might, uh, you know, raise concerns about those. But before you even get to those issues, uh, on what I might call like more traditional theological uh, issues of the last 200 years, they're both rejecting um, traditional or biblical Christian faith. So I, I bring that up both as a general comment, and it's also interesting that um, Aaron Rodgers uses the term binary, which is a multivalent and broadly applicable term, where we hear the binary language nowadays all over the place in media and in social media and conversation is typically in the sexuality issue. So you may, you may know about this, or the gender issue. Um, so you may know about this. Um, the, uh, the most popular thing you can say in today's culture is say that you're non-binary. Uh, but when you say non-binary, what that means is that, um, it, to say that you're non-binary today usually means that um, I don't identify as specifically heterosexual. Um, in other words, I'm, I have a range of sexual interest. I might be sometimes interested in you know, people of the opposite gender, I might be interested in people of the same gender. My own gender might shift and change depending on what night it is or kind of how my spirit, my animal spirit within me moves me, okay? That would be considered non-binary. And nowadays, a huge percentage of uh, teenagers and young adults um, identify as non-binary or say they're non-binary in their consideration. But that's on sexuality, okay? Um, I'd be happy to come back and talk about that again. I will tell you if you're watching online or picking this up, because I know we have people who watch our resources from around the country, around the world. We did an entire series this past fall, the fall of 2022. I know it's not online, but we did it in our Wednesday night studies downstairs. If you have big interest in going over some of that again, I'm happy to do that. Tonight, we're gonna to deal with the other more general, what I would call garden variety and broader binary issue that um, Aaron Rodgers says he has a problem with. Uh, this is the concept that there is a specific right and wrong, that there is an absolute morality that there are external determinations as to whether what I feel like or want to do is right or wrong. The Bible indicates that there are standards of morality and relationship to God and that you're either in right relationship with God or you're not right with God. That would all be considered binary. I can tell you if you're watching online, I'm looking at our group here that's in the, in the sanctuary. Pretty much everybody in here would agree that there are right and wrong standards that apply universally. Am I correct on that, folks in the, okay, folks in the room would agree with that. Again, if you're watching online, if you're catching this video later and have concerns or questions about that, please get in touch with us, get in touch with me. I'd be happy to resource you and, and dialogue with you further on this. 
I do want to go ahead and go to a, a very, it's a painful, heartbreaking example, but it's very applicable. We are recording this on March 29th of the year 2023, and two days ago, a little over two days ago, on Monday morning, um, a young woman named Audrey Hale um, went into a church as, as a way, uh, the Covenant uh, Presbyterian Church uh, in Nashville and blew through doors in order to get into uh, the school that is uh, under the auspices of the church and uh, is next door, literally next door, adjacent to. And, and she went into Audrey Hale, a 28-year-old woman, uh, went into, who, who now identifies, by the way, as, as male, but, or who identified as male until she was killed in recent days, but nevertheless, a 28-year-old female. Um, and she, uh, she was heavily armed, and she shot and killed uh, three adults and three nine-year-old children. So she, uh, she killed, among others, uh, the pastor of the church's uh, his daughter, uh, little Hallie, um, Audrey Hale also killed the, the headmaster, the head of the school, Catherine Kuntz, who apparently um, got in her way and tried to persuade her not to continue killing people. Uh, so Catherine Kuntz, who is described by countless people from the community and, and the school as being a real saint, a great woman of the Lord, she was killed. Um, Big Mike, the African-American custodian beloved by the not only the church and the school, but also the larger community there. Uh, he was shot and killed. And again, three nine-year-old children. So what I want to ask you to consider, I understand we are living in a postmodern world and there are many views on standards. And it is true, uh, we are culturally conditioned on our understanding of fine-tuning morality issues and such. Uh, but, but would you agree that not only throughout human history, but even in this point of history in which we find ourselves in the 21st century, that um, murdering three nine-year-old school children is wrong? Would you, would you give me that? Would you go ahead and give me that? and that it's decisively wrong, that there's a right and a wrong, and the right would be somewhere quite opposite of going in and murdering people in a school. Would you all agree with that? If you're watching online, I hope that you will agree with us on this. Well, you understand that I just set forth a binary standard. There, there's a right and there's a wrong. Now, we can discuss societal influences. We can discuss, you know, theories of, um, in, you know, maybe Audrey Hale was somehow bullied when she was in second grade at the Covenant School when she was there for a year and a half or so. Uh, we can discuss issues of gun control and all that type of thing, but at the end of the day, regardless of where you stand on those issues, um, I, I do believe, most likely, if you're watching this, that you would agree with the folks who are in this room that it would be considered absolutely, I'm using that term very intentionally, absolutely wrong to go into a school and to mow down, to shoot down nine-year-old children and, and their teachers and a custodian. Well, you see, at that point, we, we have established, as I've already just to turn back to this, a binary standard. There, there's right and wrong. Philosophically, nowadays, and in the, you know, this was, this kind of got in motion in the 19th century, uh, became much more prevalent in the 20th century, and has certainly taken hold in the 21st century. There's an idea that there's, there's not really a uniform standard. And that when you try to start imposing standards, you're imposing um, culturally produced, you know, ideas that you're, maintaining the patriarchy, the hierarchy, the hegemony of the West, those types of things. Uh, but I am convinced that there is no significant culture in the history of humanity that would argue that it's, it's right to kill nine-year-old children who are in a school, okay? Uh, I would also go on, I'm gonna, 
become a little more assertive here. I believe that even if you don't believe in gods, a god, or some kind of higher power, I still might be able to engage you to the point where you would say, you know, not only is it wrong, it's actually evil. Now, I'm pretty sure everybody who's in the sanctuary right now, y'all would all agree that this is evil, actually, to do this, correct? Okay, so let me just make clear the type of thing that Aaron Rodgers is saying, and it's not just about Aaron Rodgers, it's about all kinds of people all over the world today. Um, the rejection of notions of absolute standards and right and wrong and binary systems um, actually, I think, falters when we start dealing with real life issues. Uh, I, I believe in large part that kind of language and that kind of thought pattern becomes um, an excuse not to make real commitments and real decisions and as oftentimes is a cover um, for our exaltation of ourselves and whatever we want to do personally and that we don't want to have to be subject to external standards. Uh, but nevertheless, even if that's my agenda, when you start talking about if I have a daughter, a young daughter, and she's being raped and murdered and people are being carried off from my own home, at that point, even, even if I'm into this kind of postmodern, non-binary, you know, no uniform, absolute standards mindset, suddenly I'm gonna say that's wrong. Because the truth is, even as fallen human beings, now I'm going into biblical standards here, now I'm speaking as a Christian, but, but even in our fallen state, the scripture makes very clear that we still understand about right and wrong. We may not get it correct all the time, but we have some basic ideas that every human being who's ever basically lived, who's not a, let me clarify this, you could have a sociopath, okay, we can have sociopaths who don't understand this, but, but the huge majority of humanity understands it's just not right and in fact, it's evil. Again, even if I don't believe in God, I would probably call it evil uh, to go in and rape, pillage, and kill a bunch of elementary age children, okay? Um, so that, being, that brings us to what we need to deal with tonight, which is the challenge of, among other things, um, what is referred to often as expressive individualism in conflict with the Bible and with a faith and a trust in and a following of God. Again, this is just not about Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers has simply introduced us to the fact that a whole lot of celebrities, sports celebrities, movie celebrities, others, uh, want to seek out their own truth and find out what fits with them. You notice he said, it doesn't resonate with me. Let me tell you another irony about this binary thing. You understand there still is a binary going on with Aaron Rodgers, even though he supposedly rejects binary. Because the standard now is not about what God says is right and wrong. The standard is what Aaron Rodgers says is right and wrong. If it fits with him and works for him, it's okay. So that becomes actually the binary standard. You, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> we, we, basically what you're gonna have is seven or eight billion binary standards if you take this out to its logical conclusion. Every human being gets to decide what works for them and what doesn't, what's right and what's wrong. <laughs> um, in a sense, and we need to be aware of this as Christians in America, this sounds at a light vanilla stage like, well, that's just good American individualism, you know? We all get to decide who we are and what we're gonna do. I get to decide what car I'm gonna drive. I get to decide, you know, how long I wanna grow my hair. Well, great, <laughs> wonderful. But, but you see, if we start taking that very much further than what I just described, you end up with a godless um, 
hellish society. <laughs> and you end up with people who are very clearly moving God off of the throne and putting themselves on the throne. Which brings us back to the fundamental issue of human beings and where we are with God. Do you all follow that? Makes sense, right? Okay, so let's go back to... Um, well, let me read you some things about expressive individualism, and then we're going to turn to Scripture. Uh, this is from Trevin Wax with the book um, that he wrote that I committed to you this fall, I believe, at, at some point. I know I did on Wednesday night studies. Um, look up before you look in. The modern or postmodern mantra is you need to look inside yourself to find the truth. This is what Oprah Winfrey is saying. This is what Aaron Rodgers is saying. In different ways, they're very different styles and, and their agendas are different, but, but they're both saying, I need to look within myself to find what's real and what works for me. So uh, def expressive individualism, uh, this is a term uh, that is used by uh, a sociologist back in the late 20th century named Robert Bella. Uh, we studied him at seminary. Uh, here, here's some defining expressive individualism slogans. You be you. You be you. Be true to yourself. I mean, how many movies and how many books are about be true to yourself? That, that's an entire religion and a, an entire economy of movies, Disney movies, rom-com movies, all kinds of books and movies. Be true to yourself. Follow your heart. And that touches us. That really, you know, that touches our flesh. It makes us feel good. And find yourself. Your objective in life, the pilgrimage you need to be on, is to find yourself. Um, Robert Bella uh, wrote this book called Habits of the Heart uh, back in the 1980s. He already saw that this was the dominant religion and ideology of Americans by the time you get to post-World War II, you know, America. Here are seven statements of belief in Western culture that uh, are set forth by Mark Sayers, who has written, uh, summarized these in his book, Disappearing Church. Disappearing Church. Uh, number one, the highest good is individual freedom, happiness, self-definition, and self-expression. Number two, traditions, religions, received wisdom, regulations, and social ties that restrict individual freedom, happiness, self-definition, self-expression, must be reshaped, deconstructed, or destroyed. Let me repeat that. Traditions, religions, received wisdom, regulations, back to the Aaron Rodgers thing, he doesn't like the rules and regulations, and social ties. In other words, if my family gets in the way of my self, you know, fulfillment and self-definition, kill the family, cut it off. Okay? Uh, any of these things, including Christianity, including the church, or churches that are still trying to teach these kind of standards. Um, any of them that restrict individual freedom, happiness, self-definition, self-expression, must be reshaped. We need to get into them and promote new leadership and new understandings. Or they need to be deconstructed. They need to be cut down, okay, where, where they don't have any power anymore and probably people leave them, hopefully, if we can do this right, or flat out destroy. Now, by the way, when I say that, if I'm talking about the Christian church, whose agenda is, let me just ask you this, whose agenda is to reshape, deconstruct, or destroy the church? There's somebody you read about in the Bible. What's his name? Satan. Yes, <laughs> okay, all right. Now, uh, but wouldn't it be great for Satan if he could get just hundreds of millions of people who are like, yes, yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, and I guess Satan's having a pretty, he's having a pretty good 21st century. It's looking okay. All right. So the world will inevitably improve 
as the scope of individual freedoms grow. Technology, in particular the internet, will motor this progression towards human utopia. That's, that's the belief, okay? Number four, I've got, I've got several more of these. The primary social ethic is tolerance of everyone's self-defined quest for individual freedom and self-expression. If you don't affirm someone else's new identity or quest for that, then you're the enemy. Any deviation from this ethic of tolerance is dangerous and must not be tolerated. That cannot be tolerated. The, the absence of full support for everybody's individual self-determination. Therefore, social justice is less about economic or class inequity and, and more about issues of equality relating to individual identity, self-expression, and personal autonomy. Fifth, humans are inherently good. Human beings are inherently good. Six, large-scale structures and institutions are suspicious and, or suspect is really what he means, and at, at best, and evil at worst. And number seven, forms of external authority are rejected and personal authenticity is lauded. Now, let's go to some scripture and we'll talk about this further. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. We actually read from Genesis 3 on Sunday relating to Jesus' temptations in the desert and Jesus being the second or the last or the new Adam. He's referred to the Bible, as I mentioned, in all of those terms on Sunday, in Sunday's sermon. If you miss Sunday's sermon, you want to catch that, we have the video posted of that. Okay, but let's go back to Genesis 3, verses 5 and 6. The serpent is speaking to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, if you will eat this fruit, we can get God off the throne. There will be no external standards for you. You won't be subject to this binary thing God's doing to you about you can't eat of this fruit. In fact, you'll knock him off the throne and you will determine what's right and wrong for you. You will be the captain of your own soul. Now let's continue reading verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now the husband has apparently heard all of this, so he understands the appeal. He doesn't ex dispute the serpent's arguments, and in fact seems to just kind of go along with the, with the program. Which, by the way, it's very easy in the 21st century to go along with the program. I'm eating. Honey, you need to eat also. Let's all get in on the party. That's the, that would be one of the invitations of the 21st century. I want to encourage you, if you're watching online, I want to encourage all of us. Don't eat. The party is not the one you want to be in on. Okay? But, but you notice this idea that she gets to decide... And uh, I guess she gets to decide for herself and her husband, because he doesn't seem to be doing a whole lot in this story. She gets to now decide what's right and wrong. Only it doesn't actually turn out beautifully. Um, because it turns out, according to Genesis 3, when you try to take over, you're actually doing a very deadly thing. Now, let's... Let's go next to, let me see what I have up next. I sent some scriptures in. I, I realize I, let's see. Yeah, let's go ahead and go. We'll go to Romans over to the New Testament. Just a brief verse over in Romans chapter 1. Uh, 
talking about humans being human beings, uh, all human beings, not just, this is talking about people who don't know God, okay, or who, who they, they know God, excuse me, he's making the argument they know God. These are non-Jews, these are Gentiles. Um, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but the, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So these are people who realize, because all human beings, according to Romans 1, understand, or certainly can easily understand, that there's a creator to all this creation, to us, that we, we're made by somebody. We have some kind of responsibility to someone, okay? Uh, so what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 1, though, is that um, human beings don't want to honor God in our fallenness, and that we push him away, and that actually as we do that, our thinking becomes more and more futile, which means it doesn't actually work. Do you believe that the present agendas that are dominating the Western world and the United States of America and American post-Christian culture right now will thrive into the future centuries? Do you believe that? And, and the answer is no, the, the thing's gonna fall apart, okay? So that's what this is saying. It, it won't last forever, and it certainly will not fulfill people. Uh, do you believe that Audrey Hale, for instance, by, again, this is not, a, I'm not having a discussion primarily on the gender issues, but do you believe that Audrey Hale, by identifying herself as a him or a he, uh, became wonderfully fulfilled in those weeks and days before she went to shoot up uh, the Covenant School? It probably didn't work that well for her, did it? Um, okay, now let's go. Let's see what I have next up. Um, I think I'm going to Jeremiah. Yes, okay. Now we're going to go to Jeremiah. This is the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament, one of our major prophets in the Old Testament. And we'll pick up at verse um, 3. On the mountains in the open country, your wealth and all your treasures I will give for spoil as price for your high places for sin throughout all your territory. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know. For in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. This is God bringing down judgment on this generation and frankly actually several generations of unfaithful Judeans. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, who, whose heart turns away from the Lord. What do you think that means? The man who trusts in man. What that means is people who listen to other people, other human beings, to find out wisdom and to find truth sourced primarily, not derivatively, but primarily uh, from human beings. In other words, if I listen to celebrities or gurus who are disconnected from the living God, uh, then I'm going to be cursed by that. And, and of course, God is saying that God brings the curse, but the truth is, even if we take, if, if we could, or if God agreed to step out of the picture for a little while, like I was saying, it, it won't work anyway. Because human beings, this is like the blind leading the blind. <laughs> it's not going to work. Um, and who makes flesh, in other words, our present, you know, existence, our strength. Um, if I work out really hard, and, you know, am physically fit well beyond my years. I mean, I'm, I'm one of the top people in the world at various age brackets. Uh, when I'm 150, how well is that going to be working for me? I'm going to be dust in the ground. So that's not a really good long-term game plan. Again, even if, we, even if God agrees to step out of the picture here, this is not going to go down well, <laughs> okay? So um, he is like a shrub in the desert, 
and shall not see any good come. How fruitful is a shrub in the desert? Not very fruitful. Is it going to live very long? No. Um, He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness and in an uninhabited salt land. But, look at this, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. Now you see that? He trusts in the Lord and his trust is the Lord. Do you notice the difference there? They they go hand in hand, but but the the Lord uh, is saying a couple things through Jeremiah there. We should put our trust in the Lord, and we should find our trust as the Lord, okay? The Lord is our trust, okay? Um, he, this, this one who, this man who trusts in the Lord, this is like Psalm 1 and elsewhere in the Bible. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. So total opposite. Now this is, this is objectionable to somebody like Aaron Rodgers. This is very binary. There's a right way, and that has to do with trusting in the Lord and trusting the Lord and being in a, a daily relationship with the Lord, a daily reading of his word, a, a pausing to be humble before the Lord, or, or not. And according to the Bible, you're one or the other, okay? Um, And then, famously, verse 9. We were leading up to it. Here we are. This is surely one of the most hated verses, if it is highlighted, up to Disney fans, to rom-con fans, to, um, you know, 21st century gurus. The heart is deceitful above all things, And not just that, not only does it deceive you, it's desperately sick, your heart is. Who can understand it? So this is asking, by the way, in telling us and warning us, you know, even if you tried to go with your heart, you don't actually understand your heart. By the way, again, from what I understand, Audrey Hale, lots of people are testifying now that she was a very nice young woman. She had friends at the, you know, art and design school that she got her degree from. Uh, She was very loving to her cats, to her neighbors. She was very nice. Totally nice person. I mean, up until three days ago. Do you think that you can understand your own heart? According to the Bible, you're a fool if you think you've got your heart understood. And you definitely cannot understand. Can any of us actually explain? I mean, I know we can speak in broad things about like Satan or evil, but can any of us understand the intricacies of what went on in Audrey Hale's heart to make her want to do that? No. I mean, no. Um, I, verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So it turns out there is someone who knows your heart, but that someone is outside of you. It's not your cheerleading section who post hearts and likes to your Facebook page, okay, at everything you assert. It's not them. It's not even your mom, who, by the way, apparently Audrey Hale's mom is clueless as to what happened. Okay, that's, that's her mother. There is one person, though, who does know your heart. And who is that? God. And God, in fact, judges not based on some arbitrary standards. Not just, well, God's just kind of out to get some people, this, that, and the other. God knows everyone's heart. And he judges based on what's really in your heart and the fruit of your heart. That's what the Bible just said. That's what Jeremiah 9 and 10 just said. Very important passage. By the way, I just jotted these down after the funeral today, so we're just kind of, we're doing major league passages that have to do with this that we're talking about tonight. All right. 
Uh, I think I included, yes. Uh, so after I did the Jeremiah, I said, well, we should go ahead and include, of course, another really well-known passage, Jeremiah, uh, excuse me, from Jeremiah to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six. Let's see what I have. Yeah, I have down five through eight, excuse me. Trust in the Lord. Again, this trust, this is the trust in now language. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Okay, so the heart is deceitful. So what do you need to do? You need to turn your entire heart over to God. Don't try to keep a hold on your heart. Don't try to follow your heart. Don't try to figure out your heart. Turn it over to God, right? You see what's being said here? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. Now, this warning is totally key to the Aaron Rodgers thing because he's saying what resonates with him. I just don't see a loving God sending you know, a bunch of people to hell. And by the way, his understanding of heaven and hell and the throwing out the 144,000, I could do another Bible study on that, folks. Let me know if you need that one. <laughs> that is a very uh, uh, incorrect understanding of Revelation and everything else that's going on there. But anyway, um, don't lean on your own understanding. But in our flesh, I mean, even people who are faithful disciples and come to church on a regular basis and study the Bible, we need to guard against this because our flesh leads us to want to trust in our own understanding. I don't like that. I like that. That made sense to me. I think I'll go ahead and what the pastor said on that point, I like. I'm going to go all in on that one. Now, the second point he made, I'm not, you know, I'm not so sure about that. I like that part of the Bible. I don't like this part of the Bible. I just read this part because I can understand it, but that other stuff kind of seems weird, so I don't get involved in that. That's trusting in my own understanding. You understand? I can, be, I can be coming to church and reading the Bible and being pretty serious about discipleship, but still be trusting my standard, not God's standard. Got me? So this says, don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, how many ways? all your ways acknowledge him and, and the term there is to know him i mean th that's what it means acknowledge is to know him um to know god in all your ways don't just in other words don't just say well yeah you're over there god the, the language that's being used here is to know god to, to be in a relationship with god in all your ways okay um in all your ways know god and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes, in case you missed it. <laughs> Here we are, verse 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. In the Bible and in Proverbs in particular, there's two kind of people. People who trust um, in themselves and are wise in their own eyes. In other words, I I'm really smart here. And those who fear God. It's one or the other. Again, another binary. It's a big binary in the book of Proverbs. And according to the book of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and understanding. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. But my stuff is mine. That's one reason I don't like the church is because they like act like I'm supposed to give to God or something like that. I mean, you, 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 this is a common refrain <laughs> throughout human history, and it certainly is common with celebrities and others in, in the 21st century. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. Okay, now we're going to move on to Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount to close out tonight with some further thoughts. So Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 and 5. These I picked out these simply because they relate to being humble before the Lord. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit. Again, 
If you're watching online and you're an American, and to my folks, I can tell you everybody here who's in this study tonight, we do have internationals that come to worship services and such, but basically everybody in this study tonight that I'm looking at live here, we're all Americans. We've all lived most of our lives in America. And the American you know, thing is uh, not to be poor in spirit, you know, to be hardy. And, but according to Jesus, before the Lord, you need to be poor in spirit. You, not to, you, you need to, you know, let it go, okay? And the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are poor, who have nothing before the Lord, and who give up all things before the Lord. And then verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek. Now, according to the scriptures, two people are famously meek. In the Old Testament, Moses, and then in the New Testament, Jesus. And Jesus is very meek. Now, Jesus calls out sinners. Jesus, this does not mean he's quiet or silent all the time, but he is humble in his presence before God and in his gracious relationship to other people. And in particular, speaking of how you deal with children, Jesus is remarkably meek with children. I mean, remarkably meek with children. Okay, so let's keep moving um, over in towards the close of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 of Matthew. Jesus says this, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now this brings me back to something that, one of the things that Aaron Rodgers seems to be doing, which you'll get a lot of from people who have left the church or who have outright left Christianity the way he is, or who maybe they still, still call themselves Christian, but they don't wanna to have to associate with the church people, is the idea is the church people and the church have come up with this idea that not everybody is going to be in heaven because God is a God of justice. And believe it or not, God has a problem, for instance, with what happened when Audrey Hale uh, shot up some nine-year-old children and killed them. You see, I, I believe in and I rejoice in a God who says that's wrong, that's evil, that's unjust. That's, I, I, I truly do believe um, and, and rejoice in a God who says that's wrong. If you don't like that, then here's, here's what I want to make clear to you. This is not about those Christians. Now, I, I grant you, there can be hypocritical Christians. There can be pharisaical Christians. That's another conversation. It, it's true that critique of some Christians can be very valid, and churches can be led astray and be too hard-edged and too hard line. I'll grant you all that. But on the issue of heaven and hell and judgment, God is the one talking in the Bible about these things, and Jesus, very specifically in the New Testament, is much more decisive on these issues than any other person speaking in the New Testament, Jesus. So you kind of get this impression that Aaron Rodgers kind of liked hanging out with Jesus when he did some youth activities. You know, Jesus seems to be kind of a nice guy, uh, but I just don't like the way in church they talk about heaven and hell. Jesus talks about heaven and hell. So I want to challenge you if you're, if you're trying to uh, honestly to play a, an intellectual or spiritual game where you say, well, I like Jesus, I just don't like all this, you know, judgment and justice talk. Jesus, if you're willing to open yourself to him, will lead you in that conversation. And now let's move on to, uh, again, the, the close of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, picking up at verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, Jesus says, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, 
and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The truth of history, of your own personal history, and of reality is that each of us is building a house. It's our life. It's who we are. And it pertains not only to tragedies that strike in this life. And Jesus is certainly speaking to tragedies. Everybody has tragedies. Everybody's going to have things hit. When the tornadoes came through Rolling Fork, you know, a little less than a week ago, it really mattered what kind of house you were in. In some cases, it wouldn't have mattered, maybe. It's just kind of where you happen to be. The storms come. But Jesus says, um, you either are building what you have on his word, or you're building on sand. Now, let me repeat this. You'll notice that Jesus is extremely binary. It's one or the other. You're either building your life, your family, your present, and your eternity on God's word, or you're building it on sand. Now, you could say, well, there's some people who kind of do both. You know, they do a little bit of rock, but, you know, to... They need to fit in, so they do some sand, too. Like, in other words, they follow the Word. Like, when they're in church on Sunday, or when they're in a Bible study, or when they're with nice people, they act according to biblical standards. But when they're in other situations, or when they want to have sex, or when they want to make a business deal, or when they want to be accepted by the cool people, they don't follow the Word. So you could say... Pastor Martin, it's not really that binary because, like, some people kind of do the in-between thing. But according to Jesus, you're either on the rock or you're not. You're either all in or you're going down. And again, these are words clearly of judgment from the one who will come again to judge the living and the dead. But even before you get to that, this is just a reality of people, individuals, families, nations. This is what happens in history. So, uh, to Aaron Rodgers, I would say, we'd be delighted to talk with you, Aaron, if you want to talk sometime about um, the reality that what resonates with you today may not last and probably will not last. Um, There is a truth that is good and light and life. And you've heard about him. From what I understand, your parents believe in him. I would encourage you and encourage others to get your eyes off of the distraction of, well, I don't like this about those people, or these people were, you know, made me sit down during Sunday school or whatever. Get your eyes off of them and look up to the one who made you. He calls you to a different way. It's his way. It's about what resonates with him and glorifies him. I understand that's a challenge. I understand we may not want a God who calls us to obedience. But this is the God who made us, and in fact, true freedom comes in turning to him and following him and being with him. Do you all who are present have any questions about any of this? This is important, I think, truth to us in today's world. And um, let's pray. Father, Lord, we come before you. We know that we live in a confused age, and a lot of the confusion has to do with our chasing after our own ideas and trying to create and recreate ourselves. Following our hearts and exalting our hearts and maybe even being pressured into new things that supposedly will fulfill our hearts. Lord, we ask that you would bring us to your truth. I ask that you would bring Christians, Lord, to be 
renewed in your truth. Bring us as a church family and other churches to be renewed in your truth, to build on the true foundation of your word. And Lord, we pray for those who are struggling, those who perhaps have grown up in Christian families, um, who tried to help their children come to a, a faith, whether that's Aaron Rodgers, who's living a pretty glorified life right now in human terms, and certainly, is, as far as I know, has not done anything of, of grave concern and it's probably helped a whole lot of people. Uh, Lord, all the way over to somebody like uh, Audrey Hale. Lord, we pray for her family, her parents, who, from what I understand, were trying uh, to help her come to some kind of Christian faith, their, their understanding of that. And Lord, be with them as they certainly grieve right now. We pray for Chad and Jada Scruggs, their church family, the, the older brothers of Hallie, who are grieving so horribly right now. Lord, be with them. Hold them up in your care and all the other families who grieve right now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank y'all. some kind.